This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. This is the Human Action Podcast, and today we're discussing the theory of money and credit, which may be the most important book about money ever written. In fact, Professor Guido Halsman thinks in some ways it represents a bigger achievement for Mises than human action. Yet Mises produced it as his first major work in his late 20s as what we would today call his PhD dissertation. Because of this book, for the first time, we understand how and why money has value as a commodity with non-monetary uses that holds its worth over time. And it was precisely this temporal element that had eluded economists up until then, including Carl Menger, whom we discussed a week ago with Dr. Joe Salerno. Mises not only applies Menger's idea of marginal utility to money and creates an entirely new theory of value for money, but he also presents us with an early version of business cycle theory and the importance of interest rates in guiding or in many cases misleading entrepreneurial action. This is a staggering work. It's one that deserves more attention. It's far shorter than human action and an easier read. And so Professor Jeffrey Herbner of Grove City College joins us to give this a really full-length treatment and do a deep dive into some of the economic theory that Mises presents. If you like the show, if you're interested in reading the book and understanding some of the monetary theory it presents, we have an offer at Mises.org slash TMC. Again, Mises.org slash TMC for the theory of money and credit. Put in the code HAPOD, Human Action Pod, and you'll get $5 off the hardcover version of this book, bringing it from $15 down to $10, which is an absolute great bargain for the hardcover. You can also just go to Mises.org and search Theory of Money and Credit, and you'll find our free HTML and PDF links if you'd rather just consume it at no cost online. We hope you enjoy this discussion with Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, and we hope you're enjoying the new format podcast with deeper dives into presenting actual Austrian theory rather than just generalized libertarians topics. So stay tuned for the theory of money and credit. Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, thank you for joining us on the Human Action Podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's a great pleasure. Well, you, I know you just finished up your student conference at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. Talk a little bit about that and how did it go and, and what does it entail? How can people find out more about that? Well, we, uh, we are in our 15th year uh, annually for doing the uh, Austrian Student Scholars Conference. And I think uh, the uh, Institute uh, posted uh, Per Bylund's uh, keynote talk uh, on Mises.org just uh, this morning. So uh, from there, I think you can get to the um, uh, web uh, site that we have for the conference, and you can uh, not only see all of the keynotes, but you can uh, get electronic copies of the papers that the students presented. We had 22 uh, students present papers from um, about half from Grove City College and about half from uh, colleges and universities uh, around the country and uh, some from, uh, uh, from foreign countries. So it's a great program, and uh, uh, we hope to keep it going in the future. And uh, it's a wonderful networking opportunity for our students and uh, and the and the uh, like-minded students uh, at other places. And uh, it's a good uh, way to contact some faculty that they've uh, maybe read their work, or like Per Byland and um, uh, Chris Coyne, and so on. So uh, yeah, it's a great event. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're all worried about the state of higher education, especially undergraduate higher education, some of the craziness that's going on, the lack of learning, and really the brainwashing of young people. So we have to find uh, whether we, I don't know if it's uh, applicable to call young people the remnant, but we have to find the good young people out there. We have to reach them. We have to get them motivated and interested in Austrian economics and libertarian theory, because if we don't, they are going to be supplanted or outshouted or outvoted or outnumbered by the socialist young people. So I, I can't stress enough, if you have young people in your lives, high school, young college age people, to get them to Mises.org, to get them thinking about places like Grove City for their own studies. Uh, and you have not only Dr. Herbner there, but also his colleague, Sean Rittenauer. So uh, fortunately, uh, Jeff, I've got a couple of years before college, yikes, uh, with, with my own kids. But... Uh, so as I mentioned in the introduction, we are talking about Mises' this is great, The Theory of Money and Credit. It is his first full-length book. Not only is it that, it's basically his PhD dissertation. It is his thesis for his habilitation degree at the University of Vienna. He's writing this book, Jeff, uh, between about 1906 and 1911. So all this is, is pre-war 
uh, you know, just talk about how this young guy is about 31 when it's published in 1912. I mean, this is basically the first big work he's done. It's not coincidentally a work on money. And if you believe Joe Salerno, if you believe Guido Holzman, this is one of the four great Austrian economic treatises. And it's it's a book on theory, and it's his first book. I mean, as you're a professor, just just set for us how, what an achievement this was. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, it's not only a, a very <clears throat> densely insightful book, in terms of the particulars that he goes through in developing the theory, uh, but he addressed the most pressing uh, issue uh, that was left uh, un, untouched by the Marxist revolution, which was how do we integrate um, money, uh, the value of money into the, uh, into the system of marginal utility and uh, give a demand and supply explanation uh, of the value of money. I mean, this, this was a, this was an amazing achievement uh, that uh, one could expect, uh, perhaps from a from a genius who had who had um, uh, been, you know, in the middle of his career and had uh, had the time to master all of the all of the literature. Uh, imagine what he uh, j- just uh, what he had to read in order to uh, write a book on money uh, and credit. Uh, and yet, as you say, he did this. He was writing this uh, in his late twenties and then published it in, uh, in 1931. I should say uh, also at, uh, when I taught money and banking uh, about 10 years ago at uh, Grove City College, I taught it for four or five years. I use the theory of money and credit as the textbook, and it's, uh, it's accessible to, uh, to students. Uh, it, it's an amazing work, uh, deeply insightful and yet uh, lucid and clear and, and uh, organized in a way that's very accessible to the students. Well, what's strange to me, Jeff, is that I find it a far easier read than human action. Uh, I mean, even though obviously it's translated from the original German, then there's two different translations out there, or two major translations. It, it's not a tough sled. Right. No, that's absolutely right. And, and the students appreciated that. You'd see them walk in the halls with their copies of Theory, Money, and Credit, or you go to the library and then they are reading Theory, Money, and Credit. And coming in my office and asking me questions, you know, in insightful questions, they're, they're obviously grasping what he's, what he's doing and they appreciate the organized structure of it. Well, I bet they also appreciate a $12 paperback <laughs> Absolutely. As, a, as opposed to a, a $120 uh, Samuelson or whatever. Yeah, um, no. But, you know, what's interesting to me is there's this great anecdote in uh, Huerta de Soto's uh, write-up of the Austrian school where he says, but, you know, Mises read Manger's Principles in 1903. And up until then, like Manger, had mostly trained in law. And law was a little bit different. Law, legal education was a little different back then. It had some economics involved with it. But so in 1903, he makes this decision internally to become an economist. And less than a decade later in 1912, he's got theory of money and credit. Pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah, just absolutely incredible, especially given his uh, testimony, of course, that uh, when he read Menger's work in 1903, it made an economist of him, because before that, he was sort of a pragmatic, uh, soft uh, interventionist. Right. And Menger's principles does not give us a Mengerian monetary policy or a Mengerian monetary policy per per se. It talks about the origins of money, but we can't really say uh, at that point... Mm -hmm. That, that Menger had delivered any kind of real monetary theory for Mises to build upon. Yeah, that's right. About, about the only other thing was, uh, was the cash balance approach to the demand for money. So I think Mises uh, saw that in, in Menger's work. Now, for folks who are wondering, when I say the four great treatises of Austrian economics, there's some debate over this. Uh, Doctors Halsman and Salerno, for example, are not entirely in agreement. But generally speaking, people consider Mises' theory of money and credit, uh, Menger's principles, uh, Mises' human action, and Rothbard's man, economy, and state as those four. So if you just read those, you're you're way ahead of the game. Uh, Jeff, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the the context, uh, not just the Mangarian context, but the classical context in which Mises wrote this book. Uh, he talks at at some length about the banking school versus the currency school, a debate that's still somewhat with us today. So, can you give us sort of a, a rough draft of the banking school versus the currency school, and and why this milieu mattered when Mises wrote this book? Right. So the, the currency school of, of which Mises considered himself a, uh, a member, um, 
uh, held this view that uh, uh, this view that Mises uh, develops in the theory of money and credit that any issue of uh, fiduciary media, as he called it, would uh, set in motion a uh, boom bust cycle. And that the origin then of the boom bust cycle was really embedded in the monetary regime and the way in which uh, credit could be expanded through monetary inflation. And the banking school held the view that uh, this uh, Mises calls the inflationist view uh, in the theory of money and credit, <clears throat> that it was necessary for there to be monetary inflation to sort of fund uh, additional economic activity. And so he, he, uh, Mises was really writing within that within that uh, debate uh, when, he, when he talked about these issues of money and banking. Right. And the banking school, this idea is still with us today, that we need a, a flexible amount of money in the economy to, to, to allow for growth. And, and I think, if I recall, Rothbard touches on this in his short, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? In other words, what, we don't care per se about what the money supply is in society. In other words, prices adjust. Yes, that's absolutely right. So, so that's the uh, one wing of the argument, right? Is that uh, we don't need monetary inflation to have uh, economic uh, progress uh, because the structure of prices uh, adjusts through entrepreneurial uh, anticipations and uh, movements in demand across uh, all the production processes and input prices in the economy. And then Mises furthers this, right, with his uh, theory of the business cycle to show that not only don't we need monetary inflation, but monetary inflation is actually uh, harmful to the process of economic progress. Okay, but I want to drive home this point. So the banking school is basically telling us that any kind of system of full convertibility to metal of paper money is actually harmful to the economy. It's going to hamstring the economy. And the currency school is sort of telling us, look, any kind of uh, uh, b banking school approach is going to allow for paper to eventually overwhelm metal. And it, it's going to, it's, there's always going to be an incentive by kings or monarchs or states or whoever to create inflation. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, of course, as, uh, as pointed out by others, uh, the, the only drawback uh, or blind side of the currency school is that they didn't consider bank deposits as fiduciary issue. They, they thought of only a bank note issue as um, creating this uh, credit expansion process. And so in the uh, restrictions that they, they put on bank note issue, like the Peel Act, um, they were inadequate. And, and then, of course, uh, they were discredited because monetary inflation and credit expansion proceeded apace, even though uh, the banking system had, or the, at least the English uh, state, had adopted their policy. So, but why do we use the term banking school? In other words, they're a they're an inflationary school, a, 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 a notion that we need to be able to expand the money supply, but it also Im implies that we need banks. <laughs> Whether that's central banks or commercial banks, a lot of people in libertarian circles, at least today, would say money could exist privately. So, I mean, is 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 does banking mean pro bank in this sense? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure of the exact historical um, reason for the choice of the terminology, uh, why it's banking school and currency school. Uh, but Mises uh, d addresses the underlying uh, theoretical issues in theory of money and credit, where he talks uh, conceptually about banking and the functions of banks uh, that are performed legitimate, uh, important functions like financial intermediation and the production of money uh, substitutes and, uh, you know, a currency exchange and so on and so forth. So these functions are, are important to be performed in, in, uh, in an economy. Uh, whether they're performed by banks or not is, I guess, an in incidental uh, feature. But in a in a world of of Jeffrey Herbner's monetary regime, yeah. <laughs> what uh, would banks likely exist? Would they perform a a useful or I should say value adding intermediary function in the economy? I th I think the answer would probably be yes. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> right. So the banks or some institution would be valuable uh, for the function of financial intermediation, of uh, borrowing from small savers and then pooling the money and investigating the uh, creditworthy investors and then making loans and um, uh, so on. So they, they perform that function and they would uh, undoubtedly still provide us with uh, checking account balances, uh, but they would just be backed 100 percent by by money itself. 
Well, can I just, as an aside, Jeff, when I was young, you know, our, I have some memory of my great grandfather, who whose wife had died and he lived with us for a period. He had been in World War One, and had had earned his or learned his profession of electrician through a, a correspondence school, literally from a matchbook company. Like, <laughs> and and I remember him telling, or, or remember my father conveying to me that he had gotten a bank loan uh, for his house as a youngish man coming back from World War One. Based, you know, think about this at the time. There's no social security number. There's no credit system of Experian or any of these rating agencies. He had gotten a, a loan from a bank, basically based on his local reputation as a guy who had was good at his job or showed up dutifully for work or was an honorable or so. I mean, just just imagine how. And and this is not too long after Mises writes this book. So just imagine what a different world we're living in. I mean, he literally got bank credit based on his localized reputation. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very very it's a very interesting case. It's it just goes to show you the way in which the uh, function of financial intermediation, you know, borrowing banks borrowing from some and then uh, intermediating the credit to others. Uh, can be performed efficiently by these market institutions uh, in different uh, settings. You know, uh, one that's more, it's more relevant to have a local uh, base of information and a local base of operation. And then others where maybe the bank is international and has other ways of ascertaining creditworthiness and, uh, how, you, you know, the appropriate uh, interest rate spread and so on and so forth. Well, I suspect he wasn't the only guy getting a loan. No, and I, I, sus- I, I suspect the bank wasn't losing money. Right. So, um, but I want to get, I want to move to part one of this book, which is really about the, the origins of money. And I guess I want to ask you first, does it build much on Menger's uh, uh, earlier insights that, that money arises as the most saleable or marketable commodity in an economy? Does it, does it build profoundly on that? <laughs> Uh, well, it it uh, develops uh, from from Menger, so yeah, I would say it uh, it does. Uh, Mises, uh, of course, uh, solved the great uh, logical problem that had been pointed out by uh, Helferich uh, against applying the marginal utility theory of value to money, which was, of course, uh, what we call today the regression theorem of Mises. So that is all really uh, an outgrowth of uh, Menger's uh, story about the origin of money. So ha- how it uh, proceeds from a barter setting, then uh, step by step into into a, the generally saleable good, and then into money. What about this idea that money is neither a production or consumption good? Is that is that novel at the time? I wouldn't say it's entirely novel in my understanding. I, <clears throat> I think there were perhaps other economists who would have held this view, uh, but I think it's certainly a minority position. And of course, what Mises is uh, uh, trying to um, show with this is that all of the important functions of money stem from its use as a general medium of exchange. So the fact that it's a unit of count stems from its use as a general medium of exchange. Uh, and and the uh, use of money as a store of value uh, is only undertaken by people because money is the general medium of exchange. So that, I think, that position was, I think, unique with Mises. Well, what's interesting is it foreshadows a bit this debate between Mises and Hayek over what imperfect information in the economy really means to a capitalist or to an entrepreneur. Is it about a lack of knowledge or is it, a, is it about a lack of property rights and the ability to calculate? Those are kind of two different things. And I think unit of account really goes to that calculation. In other words, mm-hmm. c- capitalists need money prices. Yeah, no, you're at, you put your finger on it exactly. So uh, it, this is Mises's, the root of Mises's argument about calculation is that uh, only with money prices can we reduce all of the different uh, exchange ratios in the in the economy that entrepreneurs need to uh, know to uh, a common unit, and and this common unit is the is the monetary unit. And then with that, comparisons could be made, and we get economic calculation. And without that uh, common unit, 
then we could have all the information of the sort of raw exchange ratios in barter or whatever, uh, and it would do us no good. So when we move into the the part two of the book, what, which is all about the value of money, how money gets value, there really is no theory of value of money at the time. I mean, there are some ideas, but Mises, Mises is, is being novel here. He's creating a theory of value. Yes, he, that, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, prior to uh, Mises' work, of course, the value of money in the uh, objective sense, the purchasing power of money, was conceived uh, only through the quantity theory as a kind of aggregate relationship. And what Mises uh, accomplished, of course, was to show that that's, that's not correct uh, it's to think of it this way any more than it would be correct to think of the uh, price of uh, bread this way or that there's aggregate demand for bread and a stock of bread and so on. But you have to build the theory from individual demands, individual marginal utilities. And so this, is, uh, this, this was the big uh, achievement uh, on the value of money question. What is the quantity theory of money? Ex explain that for us. Well, the quantity theory of money uh, is just uh, based on uh, the quantity equation, which is an accounting identity that says the money that's spent to buy goods is equal to the monetary uh, value of the goods. <laughs> and then this, this equation is disaggregated into components. So the uh, money spent is disaggregated into the money stock and the so-called velocity of money, uh, the number of times uh, each monetary unit is spent on average over some period. And then the, uh, the monetary value of the goods is split into the prices of the goods and then the quantities of the goods uh, bought and sold. And so then from that point, uh, uh, it, uh, depending on what you assume about the relationship between these four these four aggregate variables, uh, you can get a, a definite relationship uh, between prices in general and the money stock. Uh, so the classic case would be, say, in the short run, if you assume the velocity and the quantity of goods is fixed, then any increase in the money stock on the left side of the equation would be uh, balanced by an equivalent increase in uh, the price uh, array on the right side of the equation. But of course, Mises brings up Cantillon. We we see that that mm. new money is never evenly distributed. We all don't get an extra zero on our bank accounts. It, it it flows through the economy unevenly, and some people get rich. And this is exactly why he, or it was the implication of his stress on the cash balance approach to money. This is this this was the bridge uh, that he used uh, between uh, the individual valuation of money and the and the demand for it that. Uh, we can then aggregate the individual demand for it in cash balances. <clears throat> and this then allowed him to see how Cantillon effects are integrated into uh, value theory. Well, okay, help me with this. I, I bet like a lot of our listeners, I don't really get, I'm suspicious of this idea of velocity of money. It sounds like this Keynesian stimulus project, where if we're all out there moving money that somehow that that motion equals action, and we're getting wealthier. I mean, I mean, I'm reading this wrong. Uh, no, no, you're reading it exactly right. Yeah, the the whole uh, terminology is uh, disorienting and and inappropriate. Uh, we don't talk this way about any other good. We don't talk about the velocity of automobiles or the velocity of men's dress shoes, and and so on as a way to explain uh, the price of automobiles or the price of dress shoes. And so Mises is saying, why, why do we do this? Why take this ad hocish approach to uh, money? Why can't we just think about money uh, and its uh, purchasing power in the same way that we think about the uh, price of any other good? It's just determined by demand and supply. And the demand is determined by the uh, value, the marginal utility that we place on on the unit of the good, whether it's a new pair of shoes or a, or a, or a new sum of money. But but all this goes back to what is money. It seems like the other schools have this mystical view of it. It's almost a historical and philosophical question as much as it is economics. Uh, I mean, what what exactly is money? If you don't if you don't accept Mises's and Menger's uh, notion of co of money as a commodity, then then uh, all kinds of divisions are bound to to happen. It seems to me. 
You're absolutely right. And, and Mises uh, takes a lot of time in theory, money, and credit to talk about these alternative views of money, you know, like um, money is a claim and so on. And of course, what Mises is insisting upon and Menger before Mises is that money is a good. And if it's an economic good, it's a scarce good, uh, then it will conform to all the laws of uh, human action that all other goods will in the market economy. And, and of course, claims are not goods, right? Exactly. Two different things. Now, now let, let's before we really get into this regression theorem and and the circularity question, let, let's touch real quick on this use value versus exchange value. Uh, Manger got into it quite a bit. Um, so the difference in a regular good, let's say a regular commodity and a money commodity is that almost by, by Misesian definition anyway, uh, the, there, there is no use value to money. It, 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 although they're both subjective, the, the second doesn't apply to, to money. You're, you, you're not, it's not like a bushel of wheat you might eat. Right. Well, uh, I would say it this way, um, there is no use value of money separate from its exchange value. Okay. Yeah, that, okay. that I think is the way that Mises would state. So no no subjective use value. There, there's no root subjective use value of money. We, In order to establish in our minds a use value for money, how we're going to subjectively rank it against goods, we have to already know its purchasing power. Okay. So we take this Mangarian earthquake idea of marginal utility of good uh, as, a, as a value theory for goods. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't take the next step and apply it to money. Mises does. Um, so he creates, I guess, what we now call an Austrian theory of the value of money. Uh, how, how sort of give us his, his process or his mindset. Well, and before, before going through that step by step, let me just uh, say this too. When, when Mises did this, he didn't just apply the marginal marginal utility theory of value to money. He he gave the final and necessary piece to explain how the marginal utility theory uh, of value can be applied to any good in a market economy. Because if you can't have a marginal utility theory of money, then you can't conceive of how it's going to be ranked in a uh, ordinal rank uh, against goods. And therefore, you don't have a marginal utility theory of goods prices either. So, so th this is what's meant by the integration that Mises achieved uh, in, in applying the marginal utility theory to uh, money. <clears throat> now, to go back to the uh, regression theorem point, so uh, the way in which it was left, uh, this, this issue was left um, before Mises took it up, was that um, the marginal, if you want to think about the marginal utility of money, then you have this, this uh, circularity problem. You can't, you can't even envision what the marginal utility of money could be until you already know the, um, the objective exchange value of money. And uh, I think uh, Wieser actually made some, took some uh, stabs at this problem by, and he was the one who first introduced the notion that there's really a time element to, or a chronology to how a person would think out uh, the subjective value of money and the purchasing power of money. We only need to know the purchasing power of money in the recent past in order to establish a subjective value for uh, uh, for it now. And so the, the problem really isn't circularity uh, along this line. The problem is we seem to be involved in an infinite regress. If we just keep regressing back in time, this uh, sequence of marginal utility today relies on purchasing power yesterday, which relied upon the marginal utility the day before and so on and so forth. We don't seem to have any stopping point and uh, this is where Mises built on Menger's uh, uh, theory of the origin of money, where Mises said, yes, we do have a stopping point. The stopping point of this regress is the last day uh, in which the commodity uh, that became money was used just in barter. Because on that day, its subjective value it can be determined independent from its, uh, from its purchasing power. Okay, so the, the circularity question, if we don't have a time element to this, we say, 
I, I'm, I, I've always struggled with the definition of this because I guess I'm here's here's my thinking is well, why do people value money? Because you can use it to buy stuff that you really want. Why do people accept it in exchange for stuff? Well, because it has value. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, so is that is that what it is? Is in other words, it has value because people assign it value, and that's that seems circular. Is that what we mean? No, I don't. I don't think that's quite it, or at least that's not the way I would put it. I think it's just in, you can see it in comparison to another good. So if we say, how, do, how does a person establish in his mind the subjective value of an apple? We can see right away that that subjective value can be established in a person's mind independent from knowing the price of the apple. I don't need to know it at all. I, I can establish this just by the use value uh, of the apple. Okay. But if money is has use value only as the medium of exchange, then I can only establish a subjective value for it by knowing what it trades for in the market. That that's a necessary piece of information mm -hmm. that I have to have in order to establish a subjective use value for money. And so if we go back in time, a day, a week, 10 years, and, and we can see that what we're using as a money commodity has value, um, the idea, part of the idea, is that gives us greater comfort that uh, that if we accept it for stuff, that it'll have some value in the future. Right. Although Mises points out that um, that money is the only good for which it's necessary for people to have some historical knowledge of of its past exchange value. We don't need to for this. This doesn't need to be true for other goods. But as you suggest, it needs to be true for money. Right. And some goods are brand new. Exactly. There, there is no past. They're a brand new product or something. Exactly. Um, but, you know, here's I think here's what critics would say, Jeff. They would say, well, OK, but 100 years, for example, is an awful long time. And uh, the U.S. Fed has been producing, uh, along with the Treasury, has been producing U.S. dollars since then. And OK, there was Bretton Woods, and then there was Nixon's uh, closing of the gold window convertibility in 71, and yada, yada. And, and you know, that's plenty far enough. And, and it, it, you know, being backed by the military might of the U.S. government's enough. And you guys are looking for some pre-existing use as a commodity for money. All, all that is, is silly and outdated. I mean, this is, this is what I imagine as the counter. Right. Well, I guess there is some point to that because what Mises is really uh, pointing out in this argument is simply uh, – a question of pure logic. He's just trying to show that the argument that's been advanced about the uh, purchasing power of money and the marginal utility of money is not subject to a logical fallacy. And he, he, he's not really interested in the historical uh, question of how one could, could in fact trace back money. Uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could actually go back historically step by step. He's interested just in the abstract question of whether or not uh, this argument that he's advanced about the marginal utility of money is subject to a logical fallacy. Is it subject to the logical fallacy of begging the question? Is it circular reasoning? And if not, is it then subject to the logical fallacy of infinite regress? And that's where the regression theorem comes in. So Mises is not trying to do some sort of historical analysis here. It's a purely uh, a logical question, a question of logic itself. Yeah, and of course, he's writing this against a background. Well, so later, he, he's going to work in various government functions in finance, public finance functions for the Viennese uh, government. Uh, he's, he's going to, to be a professor. He's going to be a lot of things. But he's also someone, you can tell from this book, is really grounded in monetary history. I mean, he talks about metals and bimetallism and, and, and all kinds of, of historical uh, elements here that, that make us, you know, that I, I think it helps... Uh, sort of alter the, the perception of, of maybe some Austrian critics that he, this is some uh, theoretical brainiac guy who's totally divorced from the real world, where in fact, he's anything but. He works for the Viennese government. He's a soldier in the Austro-Hungarian army. He's all kinds of things. Yeah. It's, it, again, it's truly amazing when you uh, read and absorb the work, how much uh, he's read and, uh, and retains and integrates 
you know, another example of this is he points out the very first uh, author who advanced the quantity theory, Dobbins Zadi or something like this, back in the Middle Ages, right? <laughs> They're probably not one in a thousand economists who even know that. Yeah, but but this is true today, isn't it? The the young PhDs in their twenties, early thirties don't don't really know. It's like they were dropped on an island. And, yeah, and, that's that's right. Very unfortunate. I mean, but it's true. I mean, do they? You know, how do we deal with that? How do we? Do, do PhD programs not require a history of economic thought? Yeah, they do not. Uh, that was uh, driven out of professional economic training, you know, decades ago. Wow, that's interesting to me. You know, for people who are interested, uh, Bob Eklund, who is re- now retired from Auburn, uh, and, and uh, he, he's co-author of an unbelievable, uh, I almost call it a desktop reference on the history of economic thought because I keep it uh, in, in my office. Now, it's an expensive textbook, you know, the textbook racket, but um, it's, it's, really, it's really quite a shame. And I, I'm, I don't know if you know this, Jeff, I'm actually happy that the, the newest person, the newest tenured full hire at, at, the, at the Auburn Econ Department is actually a, a young man. He's either from Iowa or Iowa State, who is, this is his area of specialization, yeah. the history of economic thought. So uh, I, I don't know what he thinks about the Austrians, but at least he has heard of he them. He knows who they are. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Equal, I, I, Equal and a text is just wonderful. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if if uh, and, and a newly minted PhD economist knows anything about the history of economic thought, he's just a specialist in, in the history of economic thought. It's not like uh, this is uh, widely disseminated knowledge that you have to have in order to be a uh, professional economist. But what kind of world are we in if, if somebody listening to this podcast learns more about – uh, about this than someone with a PhD in economics. It, 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 it's, it's upside down. Um, yeah, we're in, we're in the world that uh, Joe Salerno likes to criticize, right? We're out of the world of vocational economics, and we're in this world of professional uh, specialization where economists are mainly just um, advisors to government policy. Yeah, well, so we struggle with this concept of value and we come up with this, or he comes up, I should say, comes up with this breakthrough in helping us understand the value of money. And as you point out, that goes to, to the, the you know, marginal ranking of everything, of all goods. Um, it, it, part three of the book is, is basically about money and banking. So he, he starts to integrate uh, things like interest. He starts talking, uh, giving us hints of a Misesian monetary policy. He gives us hints or of a framework for business cycle theory. Um, first and foremost, we, we were talking about this offline. I'm struck by his repeated use of the term fiduciary media. So for, first, tell us what that is. And and I, I as I said, I don't think that term was necessarily in widespread use in 1912. Right. So what Mises does uh, here is provide a topology of what he calls money in the broad sense, uh, the general medium of exchange. And he he then categorizes, subcategorizes that into money proper, which then can take different forms, and then money substitutes, and then the, which are claims to money. And then the money substitutes he subdivides into money certificates, which are uh, uh, claims that have been issued for which the issuing bank has 100% reserve of money for redemption. And then fiduciary media, which are uh, claims money substitutes uh, for which the bank or issuing institution has only a fraction of reserve in money for redemption. And as he points out, that this distinction is important because only the issue of fiduciary media uh, permits the banks as a system to uh, increase the money supply and expand credit. And, and as he points out, governments can issue fiduciary media too. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. And in his day and age, that was uh, that was happening as well, since uh, uh, Treasury Department, for example, would issue uh, redeemable notes uh, for gold and silver, gold and silver certificates. Well, so the the rise of fiduciary media um, is he he doesn't talk too much about full what we would call full reserve banking or warehouse banking. I mean, the, so I guess the the question in commercial banking, not government. Uh, what what fiduciary media versus what what's what's the alternative? Well, the alternative he was uh, uh, aware of this from the currency school debate. So the the alternative 
was in fact uh, a complete restriction of fiduciary issue. Um, and uh, we, we mentioned this uh, before that the currency school, uh, their big mistake, according to Mises, was they didn't grasp that bank deposits were uh, money substitutes in the same way that uh, written out banknotes were. And so while the currency school did say, look, uh, we, we want a policy that limits the issue of uh, additional banknotes, which would be uh, uh, consistent with Mises' policy, um, they didn't extend this to bank uh, deposits. And so what Mises is saying, he's sort of um, uh, filling in this gap and saying, no, no, it, it's any sort of form of the fiduciary uh, issue that will uh, generate monetary inflation and credit expansion. And so the best policy is to stop that additional issue. So uh, I, theoretically, and this is a big debate. Again, it foreshadows a debate amongst Austrians between uh, full reserve and uh, free banking schools. Um, can you get, I mean, is this really a model for banks where they keep 100% of your money and, and you basically pay them uh, for the security of it, uh, you know, for and, and they issue kind of a warehouse receipt that's like a claim check at the opera for your code or something, and you go get your money and it's sitting there? I mean, is this a business model that's viable? Well, y yes, indeed. So this is what Mises uh, writes about, of course. He, he says uh, that and uh, I think uh, Joe Salerno takes this position, this is my position as well, that um, you don't need to have a 100% reserve regulation or a law. You simply have to have actual competition among banks that is not a system where they share reserves or uh, policy uh, in a cartelized uh, arrangement, but each bank is independent and uh, possesses its own money reserve uh, into which its uh, demand deposits are redeemable. And then the, just the competitive pressure uh, among banks will limit their fiduciary issue and will, will achieve uh, basically something close to 100% reserves. The, the, the fiduciary issue that would be forthcoming in a system like that would, be, uh, would have minor effects. Now, when, when you say cartelized, would, what, what would be unacceptable or unacceptable, or excuse me, acceptable or unacceptable, like the Federal Reserve System, okay, unacceptable, presumably in our, in a Misesian monetary view. But, but what, what if, what if a bunch of banks simply got together and privately sort of created their own uh, insurance against a bank run and, and shared the premiums and spread the risk and, and it's almost created a, a private FDIC. I mean, can we envision things like that? Yeah, well, we can not only envision it, we can look in history and see uh, the clearinghouse systems uh, did this kind of thing, uh, the Suffolk system uh, back earlier in the 19th century. And, of course, what happened is they all broke down from the moral hazard that's involved in trying to privately arrange cartel uh, agreements. They're, they're all subject to the same kind of uh, uh, problem that uh, cheaters can uh, benefit at the expense of those who continue to follow the cartel restrictions. And, and uh, it was no different with uh, private arrangements uh, to, to um, cartelize and then share, share a pooled reserve. Now, what about there are free banking advocates around like Larry White and George Selgin at Cato, uh, who are uh, certainly familiar with Austrian literature. Uh, you know, just in, a, in Jeff Herbner's banking system, are they allowed to have, uh, let's say, uh, low reserve, riskier banks that actually pay interest against the really safe 100 percent reserve bank that maybe the, the little old lady goes to for security? I mean, is, are we allowed to have this kind of uh, cowboy wheeling and dealing or, or are they are they uh, and, and I don't want to get into the whole question of fraud and, and, and right. uh, full reserve. But I mean, is that something that you would envision? Uh, banks would be. I, yeah, my my um, take on this uh, is that, uh, yes, banks would be legally free to try this out. They, they'd be legally free to try out any sort of uh, um, voluntary uh, financial innovation that they wanted to try out. With their customers and then we would just let competition take its course and so sure they could try this out but what ha but that's not really what's happened though is it in the 20th century a fiduciary oh, no. media has exploded and not, and for unholy reasons starting with um the fed yeah absolutely and of course here uh, we we would agree with the with the those on the free banking the so-called free banking side but but here's the thing is fiduciary media today versus in Mises' time, I think we have to expand this. I mean, if we look at broader 
broader ideas or concepts of what's of the broadest money supply. How much money is really out there sloshing around? You know, we've got base money, but now we've got M3 and even M4. I mean, there are, there are, there are things today we might almost hybrid instruments we might look at and say, gosh, that's that's basically a money substitute. Some people are even saying that about like Goldman Sachs bonds. Um, in, in other words, it seems like we're on a slippery slope to to creating so many money substitutes that that we have we, we have a world awash in everything except all kinds of money and credit, but not enough of the real kind. Yeah, and here again, uh, in thinking about that issue, uh, Mises is our guide, right? And he, he very uh, definitively defines what a money substitute is. It's a redemption claim for money that's perfectly secure and executable on demand for money. And and so that, that focuses our, our attention on exactly what uh, constitutes a money substitute, and then we can identify who's issuing actual uh, claims like this. And we could uh, discover then adding up, you know, what uh, all, all of these uh, money substitutes actually are in the economy. All of these other liquid assets then are, in, in a sense, uh, pyramidable on top of this base money. And, and, so, and so the problem of the extension of these other liquid assets is uh, partially, at least, a problem of the um, uh, expansion of fiduciary media at the, at the bottom of the uh, uh, base of this of this expansion, and so removing that and removing all implicit bailout guarantees and so on and so forth that generate the kind of moral hazard that's uh, shot through our system, then all of these highly liquid uh, forms would also have to be radically reduced. But look at the stuff that's out there. I mean, we saw derivatives were der, a lot of derivative um, instruments were indeed bailed out in the 2008 crash because the Fed bought them from in bundles from commercial banks. Um, I mean, we have money market funds, we have mutual funds, we have all, all kinds of bonds. It seems to me that there's a, an awful lot of, of stuff out there that in investors' minds or savers' minds is is is, is almost money. Yeah. Well, well, I think you're right. I think I think the uh, the, the in, uh, increasing liquidity, the kind of artificial liquidity that can be created by fractional holdings, uh, can be extended way beyond money substitutes. And and this is what uh, this is what has been done in our day and age. Well, let's let's talk about interest about this, you know, what it is and its function. And Joe Salerno and I talked about uh, in Manger's principle, Principles, uh, Frank Knight had a, uh, a, a not too friendly uh, snipe at Mises in the introduction to that. And he said, well, you know, Manger doesn't go quite so far as to have this, introduce this complete time, time theory of money, excuse me, time theory of interest. Um, and and so help us understand what how does Mises see interest? Uh, what what's its function and and you know how do we understand it in the economy? Right. Well, we we only get the beginning of his uh, interest rate theory really in in this book, Theory Money and Credit. But his mature work um, he adopts uh, mainly from Frank Fetter, who was a pure time preference theory uh, theorist on interest who argued that it's just embedded in the human condition that a present satisfaction is always preferred to the same satisfaction uh, in the future. So sooner satisfaction, always preferred to later satisfaction. Uh, so, so then the argument is that when money is exchanged intertemporally, uh, present money will always command a premium based on this time preference uh, element. Uh, over uh, future money. So there will always be a positive uh, payment uh, of interest made by the uh, borrower paying back uh, to the lender. So we always, for instance, we, we, we'd rather have our dream house at 40 than 90. Right. Be, because time has uncertainties. We could die. We All kinds of things could happen. Um, so we always prefer consumption or at least the satisfaction from having the money to potentially consume. We always prefer it sooner. Right. Um, Okay, so I, I think von Berver called it a, a value spread. That that's right. Um, yeah, yeah there've been <laughs> there's been a long development of this uh, theory and uh, sort of the purging of uh, fallacies. And Bumbabrick, of course, was instrumental in the purging of all sorts of uh, fallacies based on productivity as the source of interest. 
but he himself didn't go all the way to a, a pure time preference theory like Fetter did, which is what Mises adopts. And so, so there's been a kind of gradual uh, progress uh, toward the uh, Mises' final position, and Boom Bobrick was an important step in that. But but what's I think what's important here, one thing that's important is that Mises says interest is not part of production. It, it's something that that's that lies outside of that, because the you know, uh, the Marx and Engels, the, the 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 communists say, well, all, all value is created by labor. So if anyone's getting paid interest, that's just stolen from labor. And then I think even say Jean-Baptiste say says, well, it's it's kind of income from capital. But but I think what Mises is talking about is something very different here that it, that this is this is separate from the productive process. Yes, that's absolutely right. It, it's it's it, people integrate time preference into their decisions to invest in production, but uh, interest does not emanate out of production. It's just a uh, like all prices. It's a um, it's a manifestation of our preferences for things. So, is interest outside of the structure of production? Uh, the the formation of interest is outside of the structure of production, but the structure of production then comes into existence in conformity with that uh, rate of interest that, or at least the fundamental rate of time preference uh, that people have uh, concerning trading off uh, a present for future uh, satisfactions. But here's what strikes me is if time plays such an important element in understanding the regression theorem and the value of money, it plays such an important element in understanding interest in banking. It seems like even today, people just gloss over it, that they, they still don't see an intempor- intertemporal element to any of this. If you read, I don't know, uh, Krugman or something, that all of this stuff is just sort of a, you know, interest is just a policy tool. And and none of this has anything to do with time or or the, any util, you know things on the margin that that I never hear anyone talk about time. No, you're absolutely right. Economists uh, generally in the neoclassical uh, mainstream, <clears throat> I think of uh, just equilibrium, and they, so they think of the economy or even parts of the economy in a timeless way, and they certainly don't have an uh, intertemporal. Uh, capital structure like the Austrians do. So th- this is a big uh, gap um, in, in a sort of uh, conventional economists uh, thinking about the economy. And, and you're also right that to the extent that they think about this issue of interest at all, it's just the, they would say maybe the price of money or you know, the price of loanable funds in this market over here, and that uh, it can be manipulated by policy, lowered by the Fed targeting or whatever, and uh, and this would stimulate aggregate demand and so on and so forth. So it's they think of interest only as a channel by which aggregate demand can be affected by policy, as you say. And so Mises sees the issuance of fiduciary media as something that suppresses or affects interest rates. Um, get, you know, go, walk us through his nascent, I guess, version of Austrian business cycle theory that we that we get from this book. Right. So Mises says that if banks were not issuing fiduciary media, uh, then they would just be intermediating credit. So they would have to borrow these funds from savers and pay them uh, an interest rate and then perform their middleman function and uh, lend the money to investors um, at the, uh, so to speak, retail interest rate, paying the savers the wholesale interest rate. So they get the interest rate spread for financial intermediation. And then the whole uh, resource allocation that goes into producing uh, capital goods along the production structure is uh, constrained by this pool of saving that has been, uh, well, the banks are intermediating part of it, and then some of it would be self-financed by entrepreneurs and, and so on. But, uh, but it's uh, limited to what uh, savers wish to provide um, uh, voluntarily given the payment of interest. <clears throat> so what fiduciary media issue allows is for banks to, by just uh, creating fiduciary media claims out of thin air, just writing loans into people's bank accounts, uh, they can extend credit. And of course, if you increase the supply of any good, um, it, it will, the market will only clear at a lower price. So you increase supply of credit, then interest rates must go down on, on these uh, extended credit loans. 
and then through uh, through arbitration, these the interest rate will lower on other these funds can be uh, channeled into other loan loan areas, and then into the general uh, uh, pr- production processes in the economy. Uh, so at low interest rates, the funds will be borrowed by entrepreneurs, and they'll use these funds to buy new facilities or or to uh, use it as working capital to buy resources. And so production starts to be expanded in a way that's inconsistent with people's time preferences. Okay, and and but give us an example of that. In other words, um, all of a sudden, uh, you, you've heard the say, lots of things uh, look good on paper when interest rates are low. And I think this is this is true of all kinds of bubbles. Right, it's true of all the bubbles. So just take the housing bubble. Uh, so here. Uh, mortgage interest rates are suppressed and consumers then uh, take out bigger mortgages buy bigger houses this stimulates profitability for construction of the houses then the entrepreneurs who are in the construction business see both more income from their production and low interest rates for expansion and so they uh, buy more equipment and then the same phenomena occurs for the equipment producers and so on and so forth, all the way back to the extraction of raw materials. So the iron mining companies find the same um, improvement in their financial condition and the same cheap credit that permits them to also finance an expansion in their own uh, capital uh, capacity and then, of course, uh, investing more in working capital and so on. <clears throat> and so this whole process then proceeds along these lines and uh, the, the, the basic uh, unsustainability of it all uh, is realized through the artificial lengthening out of all of these production processes. That, that becomes inconsistent with the real resources that people actually desire to have allocated across uh, the production of consumer goods. And then they're saving and investing across all of the production of uh, capital goods. So let's let's take your example of a construction company. Let's say they ramp up, hire a bunch of guys, uh, buy a bunch of equipment. The 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 notion of malinvestment comes in when when all of a sudden demand for their housing in a region drops. We have a housing bust, and all these guys and equipment, because of their particular attributes or skills, are not are not quickly and easily converted into let's say that that you know now the demand is for electric cars or something, right? It's it, exactly. in other words, there's there's a lot of waste. Yeah, that's exactly right, and and the waste is felt most with. Uh, as we say in economics, the specific assets that have been built up in in in, in these production processes. So the workers can probably find jobs at similar wages elsewhere in the economy, uh, but the excavation equipment uh, would be much more difficult to transfer at its boom level prices. You know, to sell into other uses. Uh, it's the capital capacity that has a high degree of specificity that loses most of its value. And then this explains, of course, why claims to those assets like stock markets and bond markets collapse. Well, I I don't recall going through the book over the weekend, Theory of Money and Credit, which I've read a couple of times and haven't read thoroughly recently. I don't recall, but I don't think Mises uses the term malinvestment in this book. Uh, No, I don't. I, I haven't noticed that either. I don't think he does. So this is something. This is something that's that comes. This is a, a term that comes along later to describe the, what what happens in this lengthened structure of production. Yes, that's right. Uh, okay. Uh, let Let's finish by talking about the 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 closing part of the book, which is uh, you know what he calls sound money. He's already discussed politics. He's already discussed a lot of the history of money. Um, and, and you know, I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, as we as we discussed earlier, this is not a tough read. Uh, Roth- Rothbard called it the most important book on money ever written. So you know, we're, we're happy to get a copy out to you. It's it's available for free online at Mises Org. Uh, we've got a great study guide that Bob Murphy wrote as well. So uh, you know, don't don't shy away from this book if if you're not somebody who who necessarily uh, tackled or enjoyed human action because this is a different animal. Um, this is a younger Mises, and even with the translation from a German, I would say a punchier Mises. No offense to the great man. <laughs> uh, so, so when I look at this, to me, when when he says sound money, he's not giving us some Misesian monetary policy. He's basically just saying metallic standard of some kind. Right. He he, he uh, defines sound money um, in the in the, this way. I think uh, this is what he's driving at anyway. He says sound money is money that 
doesn't have its purchasing power uh, influenced by politics. And this, in his day and age, this meant uh, commodity money because the, the commodity has to be produced at cost and therefore it can't be just uh, arbitrarily inflated ad infinitum. So this this money supply business that we hear about all the time, why do we care? In other words, if if the total supply of money doesn't increase or it increases slowly, wh- why do we care? Prices adjust. Purchasing power is what we care about. Yes, that's right. The purchasing power and the relationship between uh, prices. So uh, the, the and, and as you say, the, the, the entrepreneurs in the market, uh, this is their function to adjust input prices to output prices. So even if we had a uh, time period for which there was mild uh, price deflation, we would see uh, entrepreneurs adjusting their demands as their output prices fell. Entrepreneurs would adjust their demands downward for input uh, uh, that they use, and input prices would fall, and this would keep in balance the profitability of production. So when we're talking about commodities, Historically, the dominant commodity form of money has been gold. Uh, Mises talks about a gold standard. Give us, give us the definition of a classical gold standard, but also give us, you know, a modern take. What Jeffrey Herbner's, you know, present day gold standard might look like gold in the in a modern economy. Hmm. Okay, well, the classical gold standard was a system in which each country uh, who participated in the classical gold standard defined its currency in uh, terms of uh, weights of gold. So each currency uh, was uh, just by definition then uh, redeemable for a certain uh, amount of gold. This meant, of course, that each currency, uh, say the dollar and the pound, uh, had a fixed uh, relationship in terms of gold claims Uh, to each other. So this was not a system of uh, fixed exchange rates. It was a system of uh, fixed definitions of currency um, in terms of gold. So so the exchange rates, so-called, were uh, were a given uh, just by definition. And then, of course, in the actual trade of currencies in the market, they could vary somewhat from this uh, this gold claim definition. But not very much because if they if they varied significantly, then there was an arbitrage profit that uh, investors could get by uh, selling uh, one of the currencies and uh, buying the other uh, through through exchanging gold. So, so the classical gold standard system uh, kept a cap on the extent to which fiduciary media could be issued uh, because it meant that as as one fiduciary issue was issued more readily in one country, uh, the reserve of gold as a ratio of the fiduciary issue would be reduced. And then holders of the, uh, uh, of this currency would begin to redeem. And this redemption would place, uh, uh, too much pressure on the remaining, uh, gold reserve and the countries would be forced to, to cut back. And, and so this is what you saw play out, uh, during the uh, during the heyday of the gold standard, uh, this this kind of uh, attempt on the part of governments to to inflate and then and then a drawing back as international trade uh, uh, forced their forced their hand as gold flowed out of their country. <clears throat> now, I think my my ideal system um, is one is not this uh, system at all, but of course uh, just a market system of production. So uh, we'd have a uh, Companies that would uh, market their their currencies, uh, uh, their uh, production of money, uh, gold uh, coins, or whatever it happened to be, and uh, then we would just uh, let the competition sort things out. So whether we wound up on a gold standard or uh, some mixed uh, system uh, would just be an entrepreneurial question that would be uh, determined by uh, everyone as uh, users of uh, the medium of exchange. Do you have any thoughts on cryptos and whether they could satisfy the market? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I I don't have any opinion as to whether they would win out in the competitive activity of the market. Uh, But I think, think, uh, sure, they should be tried. Uh, Entrepreneurs should be able to try them out. Well, I will say one thing about uh, Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin would win out. And it's precisely for the reason that most 
people advocate Bitcoin, uh, and this is that Bitcoin has an upper limit on its production. Mm -hmm. But if if then that upper limit were ever reached, then in a progressing economy, you would have significant price deflation, way more than we've ever seen historically. And in fact, it could get so uh, e extensive that price deflation rates could be larger than time preference interest rates, in which case no lending could be done in Bitcoin. And there'd have to at least be an auxiliary uh, money use for all credit transactions. Well, it's interesting talking about gold and whether it would win out in in Professor Herbner's ideal system. It's you know we tend to think of gold as this this heavy, shiny, bulky thing, and if, and and of course in part that's why paper currencies arose because they were more portable and divisible, and you could have smaller denominations, and they just represented gold in a bank, hopefully. Um, but the, the, you know, the, there are people in the modern context writing about this. Steve Forbes uh, has a, a book about gold. Uh, James Rickards at Agora Publishing has a book called The New Gold Standard. Uh, Lewis Lehrman has, has written a, a book, sort of the new case for gold, I, I think. Um, and, and he wrote the, the, in the 1980s, the gold report for the Reagan Commission with, with Dr. Ron Paul. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of our listeners might say, e even our good libertarian and Austrian listeners might say, well, Professor Herber, that's great, but we're, we're not going to use gold anytime soon. And, and this is all uh, in the past. And, and I'm, I'm, as much as the Fed and the Treasury Department have tried to beat us over the head with fiat for 100 years, I'm not sure that that's necessarily true in your conception. Right. I, I, uh, I, I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, it, it seems to be to just uh, be an empirical question. Um, Mises, of course, was in a different situation. It, it, was, it was true for him that gold was the obvious um, alternative that, uh, that people would accept if, if governments went back to sound money. It's also interesting that in his monetary proposal, he advocates for the uh, in this conversion agency that's going to pr uh, print currency redeemable in gold, he advocates for them to only produce really small bills and fairly large ones. Because Mises thought that just as an historical question, uh, if the gold standard was to be uh, enduring, uh, people had to actually use gold coins physically. Uh, because then when they were taken away, uh, they, they would object. Yeah, isn't that interesting? People people could actually feel the difference in their hands, in their pockets. Um, right. On that note, I'm just going to leave our audience with uh, a couple sentences from the preface that Mises wrote to the English edition of this book. This was in 1934, so a couple decades after he finished it. And he says, I'm quoting him, attempts to carry out economic reforms from the monetary side can never amount to anything but an artificial stimulation of economic activity by the expansion of the circulation. And this, as must constantly be emphasized, must necessarily lead to crisis and depression. I mean, I read that sentence to talk about a prescient guy. I mean, you you could have read that in 2008 in front of Bernanke. You could read that today in front of J Jerome Powell, and, and it would read every bit as true. Um, ladies and gentlemen, again, check out the book. It, it's well worth your time. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we do have a discount. You know, you can get a copy of this book in hardcover, actually, from the Mises Institute for only $10. We also have a discount on uh, Bob Murphy's study guide to the theory of money and credit. They're both well worth your time. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, I haven't seen you for a while. I hope to see you soon. But I, it's great to connect with you uh, via this medium. And thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, we will see each other soon at the AERC. Yeah, that's right. That's right. In March, both Dr. Herbner and our audience, I hope you enjoyed the Human Action Podcast. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.